panelists discussing our topic of the day, net zero driving energy solutions in hydrogen. I'm Eric Strayer and I'm the Vice President of International and Partnership Sales for Fuel Cell Energy, which is a leading provider of decarbonized power and hydrogen production solutions. And I've worked in the hydrogen and fuel cell space for over 18 years. And I'm really looking forward to introducing our panelists today. Uh, but before we, we dive in, uh, we're gonna start with a short video from SRTIP. I see everybody uh, greeting through the chat. I, I do want to add while we're waiting for the video to load that we will be taking questions at the end through the chat session. Looks like there's no sound from the video. economy and developing the economy of this country and creating new opportunities for private sector, <coughs> public sectors, and entrepreneurs. It's a reflection of the leadership a strategy of innovation 2020-30 for the United Arab Emirates. We are delighted and lucky in Sharjah to have the ruler of Sharjah, His Highness Sheikh Dr. Sultan bin Mohammed Al Qasimi as the chairman of the Sharjah Research and Technology Park. His Highness' commitment to education is massive. He invests not only monetary resources in developing the infrastructure of Sharjah when it comes to innovation and education, but his dedication is immense to develop, developing the whole ecosystem of education and knowledge economy in Sharjah. We at the Sharjah Research and Technology Park focus on four main objectives. The first objective is to develop an innovation ecosystem, not only based on the infrastructure of building and the street, but also the mindset of people. We also aim at developing next generation scientists, entrepreneurs, and leaders that can support our drive toward innovation. Our three, third objective is to focus on catalyzing knowledge economy, investing in technology and science and entrepreneurs so that we can have an impact and create enterprises that support the economy of the country and the economy of Sharjah and make it more competitive. And last, our fourth objective is really to invest in the future. We at the Sharjah Research and Technology Park, we identify companies and we vet them and we invest in these companies and we scale them up. Our objective is to create enterprises that will create economic sustainable business. We at the Sharjah Research and Technology Park focus on six main subjects. The first one is water technology. The third, second one, production design and architecture. A third one is mobility logistics and smart cities. The fourth one is healthcare and digitization. And fifth one is renewable energy. And last but not least, environmental technology and circular economy. These are the six areas we focus on. And these are the six areas that we believe our colleges, our private sector have a competitive edge to grow and develop. We believe in triple helix. We work with government, private sector, academia, and non-for-profit organization to develop this, our ecosystem of innovation. We have launched research activities with universities, and we're trying to commercialize this research. We also engage with government in implementing best practices when it comes to artificial intelligence, blockchains. We launch sandbox with ministries, and we work with businesses as well in developing and commercializing technologies that will make them more sustained and more competitive going forward. We pride ourselves at the Sharjah Research and Technology Park to be able to attract some of the leading technologies into our park, whether we are talking about 3D construction or additive manufacturing or agriculture technologies or photovoltaic R&D centers or transport and mobility technologies 
or mixed realities. We pride ourselves to be part of a 47,000 students ecosystem at 22 universities and education institutions and more than 2,000 PhD holders all in the same place within the vicinity of the technology park. Since its inception, the Sharjah Research and Technology Park managed to attract global players, regional players, and local players. We proud ourselves to work with international companies like GE, like Intel and Nokia, for example. We work with GE on additive manufacturing. We work with Intel on solution related to education and reskilling. And we work with Nokia, for example, on IoT labs and other things. We also have regional companies leading in additive manufacturing like Amensa. We have also mobile fueling companies like Kafu. And also we have companies in health like Nipta. We also have local startups that are thriving and really defining the way forward. Since an inception at SRTIP, we believe to have a global vision and regional mission. We believe in partnership, sustainable partnership. That's why we work with countries, with academic institutions, with science institutions, and with UN-led organization as well. The objective is to develop sustainable partnership and a win-win situation for everyone. We developed the Sharjah Research and Technology Park based on best practices. And at its start, we managed to benchmark Sharjah against nine other cities around the world, from Boston to Marseille to Shenzhen to Bangalore to Hyderabad to Philadelphia. We looked at six main innovation criteria like market and investment, interfirm activity, knowledge and R&D, human skills, infrastructure. And we looked at these things and we benchmarked with other nations around us to see where Sharjah is vis-a-vis -vis this nation and learn from these activities as we go on. Here are some examples of the bright technologies that we are developing here in Sharjah. We pride ourselves to have the largest or one of the largest transport and logistics innovation center in the world. We in Sharjah developing next generation technologies that will be promoted in this region and will become an integral part of the mobility, of the mobility solution in the Middle East. We also pride ourselves to have significant uh, investment and technology development in hydroponics and aquaponics and agriculture technologies. We believe that the Middle East food security insists that we develop these type of technologies and we work hand in hand with the private sectors, with entrepreneurs and with academia to develop these technologies here. Third, we also developing a photo, photovoltaic R&D center. Our main is to promote renewable diversity and bring new source of sustainable diversity to the energy mix when it comes here in the park. We pride ourselves to launch energy innovation hub, a regional platform to engage and attract innovations into this region and link them to the industries of energy within the region. We also pride ourselves at the Sharjah Research and Technology Park to host one of the largest maker space in the UAE, the Sharjah Open Innovation Lab. This lab dedicated to entrepreneurs, to faculties, to companies to come and co-create and co-innovate the future of technologies at the park. We develop and promote this soil lab by engaging with different players, whether you are an investor or a company or academia. They all come and co-create and create businesses and enterprise out of this lab, which features cutting edge technologies in textile technologies, electronics, metal, 3D technologies, and others. For SRTIP, collaboration with academia is an integral part of our work. We work with universities in the UAE and around the world. For example, the American University of Sharjah is one of our key partners, and we work with them on four, three main areas. One around IP and commercialization, entrepreneurship and development of science, employment and, and, and internship, and also lab exchange. We believe to have an innovation, we have to develop human capital and develop a strong link to academia and academic institution. Here, I would like to share with you some other examples of the innovation we have here. We've managed at SRTIP in collaboration with academia and industry to create a fantastic footprint, a regional lab for construction of 3D materials. So we have, today printed many houses using 3D technologies and using collaboration with education as well. Another example of what we do is we develop 
IP, intellectual property and commercialization of the IP. And the topic, for example, here is conductive concrete. Another example of R&D is we are developing an exoskeleton technology that can apply for healthcare sector and also apply for industry and then construction as well. And we do this in collaboration with academia and in collaboration with the private sector as well. The Sharjah Research and Technology Park also thrives on developing an ecosystem. I have spoken about the Middle East Energy Innovation Hub. This is a platform to develop new innovation within the energy sector. To be able to conduct our work at SRTIP, we have developed a comprehensive ecosystem that includes events and themes like the Women in Technology, promoting circular economy, and launching various accelerators on a flagship Accelerator is the Sharjah Advanced Industry Accelerator. We pride ourselves to be a home for the Middle East, North Africa Innovation Technology Transfer Summit. We would like to position Sharjah as a platform for technology innovation and technology transfer in the whole Middle East. And we work with scientists, with science institution, academia, private sector to be able to do this. In addition to that, we run a series of events at the Sharjah Research and Technology Park these comprise webinars, exhibition, conferences that allow businesses and, and partners and tenants of SRTIP to engage and grow and develop their businesses and build a strong network with investors, businesses, academia, and government. We also launched the Sharjah Angel Investor. The main aim of this angel investor is to create funds and make funds available for startups to come and grow out of Sharjah. We also host many delegations, international delegations throughout the year at the Sharjah Research and Technology Park. We host a lot of webinars and we aim to do more of these webinars to cement relationship with countries, with industries, and with different players. Sharjah Research and Technology Park also have a fantastic facilities for exhibition. We host many exhibitions and conferences at the park and we aim to continue doing that going forward. This is a summary of the Sharjah Research and Technology Park. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We look forward to working with you. We look forward to partner with you and grow with you. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, that was a fantastic video, really impressive, the, the breadth of technologies, uh, relevant technologies being worked at the Innovation Park, um, <laughs> as well as the, the global um, you know, corporate partners that are involved. So very, very impressive. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, shift to the next uh, phase of discussion. Uh, before we dive into the questions, I want to introduce our distinguished uh, guests and panelists uh, on the talk today. Uh, first, Muthana Shirzad is the founder and CEO of Protium Technologies, which is a UK and UAE startup focused on sustainable green energy for the future. Protium is currently developing the world's first net zero emission biohydrogen powertrain concept for the aviation and transportation industry, as well as a sustainable water distillation system in the UAA through renewable energies and green hydrogen to solve the RO reject water challenges, which is paving the way for a sustainable water recycling system for the Middle East region. Uh, great stuff, Muthana. Look forward to uh, the discussion. Miriam Salman. Uh, Miriam is Kamara Energy's lead consultant covering the Middle East's energy spectrum. She has been at the forefront of investigating the region's latest energy developments and providing commercial and economic consulting, business analysis, and strategic recommendations for the future supply of energy for various governmental and private stakeholders, with particular focus on hydrogen, carbon capture, use and storage, and renewables, all very relevant to the discussion today. Uh, next is Perry Markaleff. Perry is the CTO of Hydrogen for SNAM, which is the largest natural gas network operator in Europe. Perry is responsible for the creation of SNAM's Hydrogen Innovation Center, a global network of universities and research centers in the high acceleration program to accelerate innovative startups within the hydrogen space. Perry holds a master's and PhD in mechanical and aerospace engineering from the University of California, Irvine, where he worked as a researcher uh, back in 2005 to 2011 in cutting edge fuel cell technologies with, along with professors Scott Samuelson and Jack Brower. Prior to SNAM, Perry worked for fuel cell energy to push advanced technologies such as tri-generation, anaerobic digester gas to power plants, electrolyzers, and carbon capture, among others. And then lastly, in 2020, Perry was appointed associate professor at the University Polytechnic de Catalunya, 
where he teaches hydrogen and fuel cell courses in two different master programs. So if you'd like to take a course, uh, definitely encourage it. It'll be a fascinating course. Uh, also uh, joining us is Dr. Manal Shahabi. Manal is an applied economist with expertise in policy driving research on energy, economic and resource sustainability associated with resource dependence focusing on the Middle East and North Africa region and Gulf regions. She's a research fellow, a senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, visiting academic at St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford, and research associate at the Economic Research Forum. Dr. Shahabi is founder and director of Sure Research and Advisory and advises companies and governments in the clean energy space. Look forward to your input today, Manal. And before we dive in, last but not least, Aman Amanpour is an independent petrochemicals and energy advisor and consultant. Uh, his main focus uh, for his clients are in the petrochemicals and clean energy space, including clean hydrogen, uh, with 42 years of experience in oil, gas, and energy value chains in the MENA, Asia, and Europe uh, regions. And Aman is formerly a senior executive, uh, president of Shell Chemicals, head of new upstream business for Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, and the Caspian regions. And we're looking forward to having his, his input. Finally, he does have a master's degree in both chemical engineering and in computer-aided engineering. So I'm excited to uh, have Aman and the rest of our distinguished panelists join the discussion today. And we're gonna go ahead and, and begin uh, with the, the open questions. Uh, first, you know, many of us are seeing daily in the news uh, uh, regarding uh, new directions, policy directions, whether it's at the government level or local levels, uh, moving towards hydrogen for various applications, including um, you know, broad adoption as a backbone fuel for, for uh, some of the larger economies. Um, Muthana, I wonder if you could start us off. Love to hear your thoughts on why are we seeing such a big focus on hydrogen? Hi, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, SRTP for hosting this beautiful webinar and uh, the amazing uh, panelists here. Uh, first of all, let's talk about hydrogen. What is hydrogen? So hydrogen is, um, is a gas and we all hear about it. We probably yeah, have seen it in school, um, uh, but hydrogen is the purest form of energy. Um, it goes back, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the oldest and most ancient uh, source of energy. Um, it was formed a right few minutes after the Big Bang. That's what scientists suggest, what, 13.7 billion years ago. Um, that's when the quarks and the gluons, uh, they, were, they were joined together to form the electrons and protons. And one of the earliest form of energy was transferred into a molecule or an atom was actually hydrogen. Hydrogen and helium were formed by them. So it is the cleanest form or the purest form of energy that we can get. It's the most abundant element in the universe. Scientists, they suggest it's about 73% of the um, uh, uh, content of the universe is actually is hydrogen. Our sun is actually fueled by hydrogen. And, um, and we don't, unfortunately, we don't find it in its um, pure form or a molecular form on, on our planet Earth. It's always been um, uh, joining um, other molecules, either carbon or, uh, or, or oxygen to form water or uh, with the nitrogen to form uh, meth uh, the uh, ammonia or carbon forming methane gas or with the carbohydrates. It's, it's everywhere, hydrogen, but we, we, we cannot. We have to extract it from some, some sort of media. And um, one of the most common way of uh, producing hydrogen where scientists have found in the last couple of uh, decades or centuries is electrolysis, where by putting, adding energy to the water and that splits the water and um, adding energy and breaking the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, separating between them. And we get to have the, uh, the hydrogen from one side and the oxygen the other side. Um, however, it wasn't, um, um, you know, it, it's not widely has been, uh, the hydrogen hasn't been widely extracted in this method. Um, at the moment, 95% to 98% of the global hydrogen production, it comes from steam methane reform and coal. Uh, and coal. Um, however, there are also other methods of producing hydrogen, the biohydrogen, for example, which is still in the early stages. Um, we color code them. It's not because the, the hydrogen has a, a color. Uh, hydrogen is uh, very light and it's the first uh, element, uh, the first element in the periodic table, and it's the lightest element in the universe. 
and it doesn't have a color, but we color them to, to identify the source of the hydrogen. So we just label them so we know what, what hydrogen. And the hydrogen which comes from electrolysis, we call it green hydrogen. The hydrogen which comes from uh, uh, the steam methane reform or coal, we call it uh, gray or, uh, or, or uh, blue hydrogen, uh, gray or brown hydrogen. And the, um, the same hydrogen which is produced in these methods, if we capture the CO2, then we call it a blue hydrogen. Um, producing one kilo of hydrogen requires a lot of energy. It's about uh, 50, 50 to 55 kilowatts an hour. Um, uh, and in return, we get about 30, 33 kilowatts of an hour from one kilo of hydrogen. So there's always an addition of an energy that we have, we, there's an energy that we have to put into the process uh, through the electrolysis. Unlike the steam uh, methane reform, um, because it comes from a fossil fuel, nature has helped us over millions of years to add those energy into the fossil fuels. And we ex we, all we do is we extract uh, the fossil fuels were under the ground and uh, we purify them and we reform them to use the hydrogen so we don't have to put a lot of energy. Um, currently hydrogen has been widely um, known as the silver bullet or people think it is a silver bullet that is going to solve the global uh, crisis and the environmental crisis and the, uh, the global warming but unfortunately um, we need to um, identify the, the proper use of hydrogen and where is it going to be the most efficient use of hydrogen in, in, in the world in order to decarbonize our future. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Muthana. I always learn something new uh, uh, every time I talk to you. Um, so fascinating. Uh, thanks for the overview on uh, the background for hydrogen. Um, you know, building on that, uh, Manal, I'd love to hear uh, your perspective on kind of why we're seeing such a such an increasing and stepped up uh, focus on hydrogen these days. Hello, everyone, wherever you are, and thanks very much, Eric, for this wonderful introduction and for the organizers. Uh, delighted to be with you today. Um, I think you ask probably the most important question when we kind of think about positioning hydrogen in the global energy transition plans. And I think just uh, building on the excellent introduction that Muthana had given us of what hydrogen is and how it is um, um, sourced. I mean, we have to remember, well, the first thing to remember is hydrogen use in energy isn't new. It dates back to late 50s or 60s and it was used in you know, aviation and by NASA and in other, um, um, in, in, I guess, um, um, applications at the industrial level. And then of course in fertilizers and as a feedstock, but um, as Muthana mentioned, most of it at the moment has been coming from um, basically fossil fuels that produce carbon. And as the world had kind of, as our awareness of climate change has increased over time, and then we've seen both companies, but also governments commit increasingly to fighting climate uh, change and reducing the effect of that, you know, with the, with the increase of knowledge of science of the effects of that on not just currently on the planet, but also the future sustainability of, of the planet and what it means and uh, for, for the world really. Um, but also definitely with increase, not just with the Paris Agreement, but also increased commitments at a government level and a policy level uh, towards uh, investing and uh, championing, so to speak, the use of cleaner energy sources. I think this is what's given more rise to hydrogen now, even though obviously it's been used quite extensively. But because uh, when, even though it's been, um, as was I mentioned, most of it at the moment, 95 to 98% is produced from fossil fuels, but when we burn hydrogen or its derivatives like ammonia, for example, at the point of use, there, there are no carbon emissions. So, and also, so that's kind of the clean source of it. And then the other part is it has, it's very versatile. It has very um, uh, wide applications from transportation to manufacturing to uh, obviously fertilizers to it can be a feedstock. It's an excellent energy carrier and energy storage medium. So these um, possibilities that it could be used in these different facets then allows it kind of also this potential to be really a very important solution in um, um, a, a solution for energy, both energy security, but also economic security and, and continuing having an energy source that's also clean. Um, and in addition to that, I think um, when we see it, who's investing then in hydrogen, there's obviously energy companies, uh, but then there's also uh, energy producers. And, um, you know, we see very clearly from the Middle East, for example, or um, Australia or the US, this interest of, well, we are already big players in the energy field, but the world is also moving increasingly towards away from fossil fuels or 
or carbon emitting fuels into more cleaner fuels. So there's a, a way there than an opportunity to invest increasingly in hydrogen because um, it can be produced from fossil fuels and especially with the increase of um, carbon uh, capture um, utilization and, and, and storage um, um, uh, technologies, then we're able to separate basically the carbon from some of the, um, uh, from the hydrogen that's emitted if we use fossil fuels in the production, or it could be used in from nuclear or from renewable sources, and then we can produce basically no, in the supply chain, uh, there's uh, a lot less carbon emissions, plus producing an energy source or fuel or a carrier, which is hydrogen, that's also clean. So all of this potential then offers opportunity, economic opportunity for hydrogen, play, uh, for energy players to remain in the game, so to speak. And we can't forget that we are also seeing traditionally energy importing economies becoming more interested also in investing in hydrogen, because then it offers them an opportunity, obviously for them, it's energy security, but also potentially a, a source for them to export. So we see Morocco, for example, we see countries in Asia and, and uh, Chile, and we, we're also seeing it's really an opportunity for lots of players then to kind of join in this. So there's, I think, this combination of, you know, the economic, the environment and the energy source that hydrogen presents makes it potentially uh, uh, play a very important role in the energy transition going forward. Yeah, excellent. No, I, you know, thank you for your insights. I, I think I think you you both have, have kind of described all all arrows are pointing towards hydrogen. Um, you know, certainly things are moving in that direction, driven by I think you touched on it, Manal, Paris Climate Accord, uh, which is really you know set into motion a domino effect where you know corporates are adopting uh, policies, uh, setting targets for achieving um, net zero or carbon. Uh, emissions reductions, you know, in, in accordance with with that agreement. Um, so certainly, we're seeing kind of a, a global movement in that direction. You guys also touched on, you know, the different types of hydrogen. Uh, certainly, green hydrogen from renewable sources, uh, electrolysis, uh, and then blue and gray and some of the other types, um, you know, that are created from from less or, I guess sources that, that would have carbon emissions if not uh, fully mitigated with carbon capture. So I, I'm wondering, is, uh, is green hydrogen itself essential to achieve net zero carbon emissions or will there be a role for some of these other types? And I'd like to hear um, uh, a response to this one from Aman. Aman, could you give us some, some thoughts on, is green hydrogen essential to achieve net zero? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Eric, for the kind introduction and moderating our session. And thank you to Sharjah Research and Technology Park. The short answer to your question is yes, indeed. Uh, so, um, but um, uh, in which ways and means can hydrogen or clean hydrogen help uh, achieving the emission targets? Uh, the, again, uh, the, the headline of, of, of my answer is to uh, be applied in the sectors which are difficult to abate, hard to abate. So those which are less difficult uh, to abate uh, of, of emission and uh, carbon dioxide, they are areas where other ways and means like direct electrification could of, of course be very efficient and effective without, uh, without energy losses, etc. But as Muthana mentioned, application of hydrogen thermodynamically, uh, of course, is associated with some losses. However, if the losses are being compensated by, by cheap sources of renewable energy, then you can, of course, enter into the, uh, you know, the world of um, renewable-based uh, uh, hydrogen, clean hydrogen, green and, and blue, and then you can utilize and you can justify utilizing that hydrogen for, uh, for, uh, for, for avoiding or minimizing the emissions from certain sectors. I start with transportation. Transportation, of course, the uh, front end of it, uh, which is more familiar with everybody, you know, the light vehicles, et cetera. Again, that can be very well served by electrification directly, for example, but there are hard uh, vehicles and heavy transport vehicles like trucks, like ships, like trains, like even in aviation. And of course, uh, the marine application where electrification directly has lots of technical issues, which I'm not going to go into that. There, hydrogen 
can of course be very effective and efficient, even efficient, in terms of uh, in terms of abatement of the emissions and and and, and achieving the uh, net zero targets. So uh, then I would move to the industry. So the industrial application of hydrogen uh, for for the same purpose consists of uh, again as a headline. It's about, um, we're talking about steel industry, we're talking about cement industry, we're talking about refinery, and we're talking about petrochemicals and chemicals industry. So let me talk about refinery and chemicals as an example. Uh, it is also, uh, you know, this is the sector which I'm, I've been serving for decades. Uh, actually, uh, many companies, many uh, big oil and gas companies who have entered into the uh, world of clean hydrogen, like my ex company Shell, they do believe that uh, they can achieve their target by strong implementation of hydrogen in the refinery and petrochemicals uh, operation, or saying it reversely, if they don't use hydrogen, they could not achieve those targets. So in refinery, a, a refinery is always short of hydrogen. And of course, lots of hydrogen is being, uh, has been uh, utilizing over the decades in the refineries. If those hydrogens are clean, i.e. green or blue, of course you are decarbonizing uh, refinery operations. You need hydrogen for hydro cracking, for um, hydro desulfuration, uh, desulfurization, and for uh, hydrogenation. Then of course, if uh, that refinery products are going to go to petrochemical plants, then of course uh, in those petrochemical plants, uh, even with the traditional products, you need lots of hydrogen. Now, the news is that in the last couple of years, the big companies, they have started to actually transform their petrochemical and chemical and refinery operations, but, not, but by not only further and stronger integrating them, but also by redefining the product stocks. For example, the target is to reduce kerosene and gasoline and gas oil after integration of uh, petrochemical and refinery complexes, and then adding new products, adding new products based on hydrogen, and not only hydrogen, but based on hydrogen, integrated with a circular economy, with bio-based product in new processes, and then creating new products like sustainable aviation fuel, uh, which is a combination of hydrogen, captured CO2 by CCS process, um, and, then, uh, and then creating liquids, liquid aviation flu, uh, uh, fuel comparable to kerosene, uh, which is called sometimes e-fuel because the origin is electron. Origin is the renewable energy uh, which has uh, been converted into hydrogen. And then I can go on and on. Then, um, <laughs> of course, um, it, hydrogen in the same chemical and petrochemical processes can be integrated with bio-based, uh, let's say, feedstocks, gasification of biomass, gasification of, of actually used oil, cracked oil and animal fats, uh, fats and then uh, creating a new slots of uh, bio, uh, let's say, uh, re renewable and sustainable feedstock for further cracking in the, in the ethylene crackers. Ethylene cracker itself, instead of using natural gas and fossil fuel, can use electrification for cracking of, 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 of its feedstock. And that electrification partially could come from green or blue hydrogen converted to, into electricity. So uh, I stop here on refinery and petrochemicals. Then you can, you can have a green steel, which is the usage of green or clean hydrogen instead of coal coke for direct reduction of iron ore for production of, of steel, a huge potential. You can utilize clean hydrogen in cement uh, uh, factories, in cement kilns, instead of using fossil fuel. And um, uh, 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 yes, so I, I would stop here. I, I, I can build on that if, if there are further questions later on, because I know uh, Manal would like also to contribute. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think we can certainly come back to that, and, and certainly Iman. And and you know, I appreciate 
uh, your perspective, especially given you know your your decades uh, in the oil and gas industry with Shell, and, and really your line of sight to um, as you mentioned, a lot of these um, hard to abate sectors, and just how enormous this problem is to to decarbonize um, you know our energy sources at from you know central generation and and all the way back to to uh, the end users and industrial. Um, energy consumers. Um, we're going to shift um, to the next question. Um, you know, Perry, similarly, uh, your, your uh, line of sight and working at uh, natural gas uh, transport, one of the largest in Europe, uh, in, at SNAM in Italy, uh, could you give us your perspective on how we can best minimize, how hydrogen can best minimize carbon emissions? Thanks, Eric. Well, I think I'm in a bad spot because I think my colleagues already said everything. So <laughs> it is already hard to add on on, on what my, my, my colleagues said. But I think the message is clear and I agree with all of them. I think um, the message is that hydrogen certainly will, you, will, will, will help to decarbonize. And I think that hydrogen will decarbonize everything that cannot be electrified. And I think that's the message. Let's electrify first which means that we'll be able to supply green electrons because we will be adding more and more clean energy, renewable or decarbonized energy to the grid. So everything that can be electrified, let's electrify. That means, for instance, yeah. the residential sector. That means, for instance, you know, electro-intensive industries that don't need uh, or don't have thermal processes. That means certain types of mobilities, everything that can be electrified, let's electrify it. That's, I think, the, the, the starting point. Now, unfortunately, there is still a lot, there are still a lot of things, a lot of sectors and a lot of subsectors within the economics sectors that cannot be electrified. And that's when hydrogen comes in and that's when hydrogen can help. Um, my colleagues already touched on all of them. Um, for instance, in the industrial sector, steel manufacturing is of course one of them that's very, very hard to electrify. As at SNAM are working with the steel manufacturers and helping them to turn the operations from natural gas, which it's tricky because they've been working on natural gas and iron ore for decades. And now we're telling them now you need to switch to hydrogen. Well, that's complicated, right? And, and, and we'll touch on that later. Um, but similarly to the steel uh, sector, you have ceramics, you have glass, you have cement, all these heavy industries, the petrochemicals, of course, that Amand referred to, all these heavy industries that need a lot of thermal energy, that's when hydrogen com can come in and they can, um, and it can decarbonize. And, and as Manal said, and, and, and Mutana, uh, why is that? Well, with hydrogen doesn't have any carbon attached to the molecule. So if you burn hydrogen, which has a great heating value, uh, if you burn it, the only thing that you produce is water. Of course, there is the issue of NOx, uh, which is something that we are paying uh, very, very uh, close attention. And we're working with universities around the world that we, when we burn hydrogen in these thermal, thermal intensive industries, we don't produce NOx. So in other words, we don't create another problem by fixing one, but that's something that's solvable. And actually it's being already demonstrated that we can burn hydrogen without NOx. Um, so that's, that's on one side. On the industrial side, hydrogen can help for everything cannot be electrified. On the mobility side, that could be a long discussion. Uh, everyone agrees on the heavy and uh, the heavy uh, mobility sector. That looks like hydrogen has no um, um, competition um, because clearly you need to move huge payloads. You need to have long distances, and it looks like hydrogen is a better. Uh, peak than batteries. Um, on the light duty, I think that uh, we will see. If you ask me directly, personally, I think that hydrogen will have a bigger, a bigger play than we think. And the reason is because all the batteries are very efficient and batteries are getting better and better. I agree. You can charge them faster. You can, you know, they give you higher, long longer autonomies. You still need the infrastructure to take advantage of these new batteries that are coming. For instance, uh, we were looking at this solid state battery that you can charge in six minutes and gives you a 
range of a thousand kilometers. That's all you need, that's perfect. The problem is to take advantage of these specifications of this amazing battery that will be commercial in a couple of years, you need almost one megawatt of power to be able to do it in six minutes. If you don't have one megawatt of power in your garage or in your parking lot, it doesn't matter how amazing this battery is, you still <laughs> need three hours, four hours, six hours, because you need to put that many kilowatt hours to be able to go a thousand kilometers. So, you know, I am from Barcelona where 90% of the people live in buildings and we park on the street. And, you know, I'm very skeptical of the battery sector, of the battery for the light duty sector. But again, that's something that we will see. Um, so far, the industry is proving me wrong because all the big automakers are going for the battery electric vehicles, except, of course, the, the usual suspects on hydrogen like Toyota and Hyundai and Honda. Um, but that's something that we will see. So to summarize, let's electrify first and then whatever cannot be electrified, let's use hydrogen. Thank you, Perry. And, and you know, uh, despite your comments, you managed to expand the conversation. Uh, some great points, uh, especially diving into the transportation sector. You know, I think it, your, your, your points also illustrate that, yes, there are uh, recurring themes, you know, whether, uh, you know, it's, it's really not specific to a particular region. Uh, this, this goal or this challenge to decarbonize is, is very, you know, we have the similar, the same uh, types of end users in each re region around the world. And so the good news is that as we develop solutions in each region and each end use application, we can re uh, repeat that, that solution um, and, and replicate it. Uh, to help solve uh, problems in other other places, um, Manal, uh, love to hear kind of your perspective also um, to build on that. Uh, from from your, your your view, how can how can uh, hydrogen best play a role to minimize carbon emissions in the economy? Um, I think the previous speakers have kind of covered a lot of it already, but I think just to build a bit on what Perry had said, um, I think. The And actually what um, I think Aman had said also, I think the key is these hard to abate sectors, especially because sometimes we cannot do, uh, you know, you cannot replace, for example, cement in, in, the, in, the, um, yeah. in the production of cement. You know, what do you use instead of fossil fuels? And you might not be able to electrify it. So then this is where also hydrogen provides a source or an opportunity, particularly in the areas that we cannot um, um, electrify, uh, but also in these, I think, industrial uh, manufacturing where, manu where hydrogen will have quite an important role going forward. And if you look at, for example, some of the industries that produce the largest emissions and then kind of take it from there. So, you know, steel, for example, I think it was mentioned, steel by itself currently produces between, I think, estimates five to eight percent of green has um, gas emissions. So there's an opportunity here that, and that's a hard to abate sector. It's a difficult sector to reduce the emissions from that. But if there's a role for hydrogen then or clean hydrogen to be used in it, then we can also reduce the emissions from that. The same uh, with, uh, you know, with cement, which is about um, as well about 8% or so of, of global emissions. Um, then evidently fertilizers, we can't forget that, you know, fertilizers and ammonia yeah. are a very important role and already very much in demand. And I think this is probably the key areas that are kind of the areas where hydrogen green, clean hydrogen can have the largest effect in reducing emissions globally. Um, transportation was mentioned. I think this is interesting because I think uh, while still the competitiveness of hydrogen vis-a-vis -vis, uh, fossil fuels is yet is, is just it's not um, a competitive at a price level at the moment when there's no carbon taxes globally. But in the mobility sector, actually, there is um, hydrogen has been competitive, but we don't have sufficient infrastructure um, as well. So this is also an opportunity where um, hydrogen can be, be more investments to actually achieve um, the emissions that's required. But having said that, um, and kind of building on the previous uh, question, I think we need to remember that one, this is potential. Um, and then two, we need significant infrastructure and investments to get to that potential. 
And currently the estimates are about around um, of what the role of hydrogen, clean hydrogen will be in these different industries up to about what 20% or so of global demand by 2050, reducing around 25% of what today we think the emissions are. So that's very large, a quarter, but that's not enough. So it has to be supplemented by, you know, whether it's efficiency uh, solutions or, or even nature-based solutions, I'm, I'm a big um, supporter of those, or um, uh, evidently electrification, as Perry has, has uh, um, mentioned. So while it's extremely important, it's not the only bullet solution that is there or, or is sufficient to really get us to net zero. And I think we need to remember that when we think of how hydrogen then fits in the larger picture of energy transition going to net zero targets. Fantastic. Thank you, Manal. Um, you know, I think we've, we've really, you know, flushed out really all the, all the points, all the challenges. We've talked about e-fuels, tra transportation, hard to abate sectors. Um, you know, certainly this is, this is an enormous challenge to get our arms around. Um, you know, given all of the, the work and, and everything that we're hearing about, uh, Miriam, I'd love to hear, you know, where do you think uh, we are today globally on the road to net zero, which is the ultimate goal? Thanks, Eric, and uh, thank you for the introduction and all the wonderful answers by my colleagues so far covering this very exciting new fuel hydrogen, which is driving climate ambition across the globe. Um, your question, Eric, on where we are globally on uh, net zero. Now, net zero, we broadly understand it to completely eliminate emissions CO2 with strong reduction in GHG emissions by 2050 to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius as per the Paris Agreement. And um, this is being achieved through a variety of measures, mainly through strong action on clean energies like renewables, biofuels, synthetic fuels, energy efficiency improvements. Hydrogen has become an important element of this decarbonization drive. And increasingly it is being regarded as the only long-term scalable and cost-effective option for deep decarbonization in sectors like steel, maritime aviation, like my colleagues just pointed out to, um, others that are really hard to electrify. And recent developments in this regard speak to its growing importance. We saw from the recently concluded uh, COP26 summit in Glasgow, a number of outcomes that sort of uh, spell the end of the fossil fuel segment. We had several pledges announced. Uh, we had the global methane pledge, which aims to reduce methane by 30%, I believe by 2030. Uh, the end of public financing for oil and gas projects, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, the phase down of coal, uh, the Powering Past Coal Alliance, et cetera, um, which could shift a lot of um, important investment, a lot of important financing out of fossil fuels and into the clean energy transition. Um, other developments uh, from the summit and others like deeper national, nationally determined contributions um, and uh, clearer rules on carbon credits, of avoiding double counting, et cetera. They have begin to, begun to highlight the extent which uh, stakeholders are now under pressure to increasingly pursue a low carbon path, particularly in the case of fossil fuel producers. Now, net zero progress still remains far slower than where it needs to be globally. Uh, we had several net zero scenarios published in the last year. We had IPCC, we had IEA, we had DNV, um, et cetera, expressing concern um, over the still existing gaps between climate mitigation ambitions and net zero ambitions. Um, in fact, uh, the United Nations uh, gap emissions report for 2021, uh, they concluded that at the current level of commitments that we have and the current action plan, we are still um, en route to 2.7 degrees Celsius of global warming by 2050. Um, so what becomes really important is the medium term. So this decade, 2020 to 2030, we need more progress on medium term technologies like um, CCUS and hydrogen, which will then obviously override and go into long term. Uh, what happens here is that because they require a lot more support, um, once they begin meaningfully abating carbon, they will also set down the stage to bring hydrogen to scale. Um, I think the IEA, they said that hydrogen and CCUS could provide over 50% of total emission savings between 2030 and 2050, which makes both those decades very important. But this requires significant scaling up of current commitments and actions towards net zero. Market design um, and price formation will be most important because they will allow to leverage a capital in, inno in innovation for these technologies because most existing uh, climate neutral approaches to mitigate emissions 
are already mature, technically and commercially, like renewables. Um, they also help on the road to net zero, but not alone and especially not on schedule if we have to reach it by 2050. It sounds a little pessimistic, but regardless, there has been a positive progress. Um, the even, uh, even patchy progress towards net zero has resulted in significant reduction for um, investment in glo global oil and demand, which will then affect demand. This forces producers, fossil fuel producers, to diversify their operations and end uses, particularly in the downstream, transport, heavy industry, all the sectors that my colleagues already covered. Hydrogen becomes crucial there. Now, in the region, uh, we, we saw Saudi Arabia, they announced uh, net zero ambitions by 2060, the UAE by 2050, uh, which will require concerted effort on um, at least initially carbon capture um, as an integral actor, which will support hydrogen um, and scaling it up. Um, more ambitious national de nationally determined contributions, they will increase pressure on oil companies to reduce their um, indirect emissions uh, or scope three emissions as we call them, uh, which can be reduced only by selling less product, which is not entirely appealing for these countries and companies because they rely on them for their rents. Or they could uh, target non-emitting uses of petroleum, such as embedded products uh, probably, or um, long life petrochemicals and plastics, CCUS and combustion, conversion of petroleum to low carbon fuels with CCUS, or they could deploy offsets um, through direct air capture, forestry, et cetera. But even for these, uh, these require costs to be driven down and they have to meet concerns over land use and their permanence. Hydrogen will then effectively become critical for decarbonizing industry and all the other sectors we discussed, something that is now being recognized by countries in their long-term strategies. Um, we know that a number of the countries in the lead up to COP26 and in the last couple of years have put out enhanced NDCs where now hydrogen has also been mentioned. Um, the UAE's second NDC does mention hydrogen and Chile um, and the US have also included it. Hydrogen is for net zero and it will start with blue as an interim to green. And for this finance is an important aspect, particularly with um, still developing countries, many of which are still traditionally energy importers. Uh, mobilizing finance to assist these countries in meeting their clean energy targets could see hydrogen play a major role because it could bypass the traditional um, large fossil fuel-based infrastructure in other key hubs of the world, which has considerable inertia. And they could directly go to renewables and electrolysis for hydrogen once costs become that low. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, some great points. And you know, I think I think you you touched on it, mobilizing uh, financing. And, 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 you know, I think that's a, that's a, a key underlying enabler to uh, really advancing the progress. And I'd like to come back to Perry, you know, from, from what I, I think my view is that, that Europe is, has been probably doing most of the lead work on policy development uh, and hydrogen valleys ahead of uh, many parts of the, uh, many other parts of the world. Um, from your perspective, where do you think we are on the road to net zero and, and, you know, do you see the level of investment uh, starting to ramp up or at an adequate um, level to where we need to be? Well, I think I am an optimistic. I think that uh, by 2050 will be in a much better place than today. I want to believe that because that's why I wake up every morning and I work really hard and I make my team to work really hard. That, that's the objective of all of us here for sure. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. We have a tremendous a lot of work to do. Um, we need, I mean, to start with, and that's a good thing, we have a lot of goodwill. And not just from the legislators, but we can see a lot of corporate mindset in which companies are basically focusing their strategy on decarbonization. And that's a shift by itself that can help tremendously and should make us feel really good and, and optimistic, as I, as I said before, that I feel optimistic. But we have to make sure that these corporates, these companies, these um, put their money where their mouth is. And that's where the challenge is, right? We need to make sure that the companies really invest. We need to help these companies to transform their processes, to transform their businesses into a decarbonized business, which is not an easy task to do. Similarly, we need to push our legislators to also implement the very, very aggressive uh, goals in the carbonization that they have that Miriam just, just uh, uh, summarized really well. We need to help them as well because, again, 
it's very good and it looks very trendy and nice to say these things, but now you need to implement them. So again, we need to push the corporations to implement their corporate strategies, which most of them now are around the decarbonization. And we need to also push the legislators with different, different measures that they need to take. From our side at SNAM, um, just speaking about putting the money where, where their mouth is, uh, our CEO just recently announced that for the next 10 years, we will invest 25 billion in energy transition in Europe and Middle East. Um, that's why from my team, we're working a lot on R&D and innovation because it is a lot of R&D and innovation that we need to do in order to be successful. I think it was Muthana at the beginning who said that for each kilogram of hydrogen, you need about 50 kilowatt hours. And that's, that's optimistic, that's true. But we can get better than that. We can get better than that, but we need to push innovation. We need to invest in R&D. And that's why SNAM, we have created the Hydrogen Innovation Center in which a global R&D network of universities and research centers uh, starting in Italy, but now expanding to the US, we're funding specific research that we think it's gonna be necessary to lower the price of green hydrogen, that's the first driver, to in develop new technologies that will produce low carbon hydrogen, that's the second driver that we have within our linear lines of research. The third one is, um, we need to prepare SNAM's infrastructure um, and, and be the example for the other TSOs to bring hydrogen through our pipelines, because this is an amazing asset that we already have and it's been paid for. So let's use it to bring hydrogen, in our case, for instance, from North Africa to Germany through our pipes. That's something that, of course, SNAM wants to do. And it's the most cost effective way to bring in hydrogen from a place where there is sun to a place that is no sun, just to give an example. Um, and the fourth driver, which in my opinion is the most important one, let's help the end users to transition from a fossil carbon-based fuel to hydrogen. And for that, we're working with technology developers, for instance, on working on uh, furnaces that can be using pure hydrogen, on fuel cells that can decarbonize the power sector. So um, fuel cells that can decarbonize mobility sector, et cetera. So that's all we're working on. I'm optimistic, but guys, we have to do a lot still. There is a daunting uh, task uh, ahead. But at the same time, it's also a great opportunity for business, right? Um, so uh, we should be optimistic and again, waking up every morning to do this. Excellent, Perry. And I, I share your optimism, and, and uh, but you know, the reality is, yes, there, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to require sort of all hands on deck to, to advance uh, both the discussion and the action. Um, you know, certainly, I, th I think you highlighted it, Perry, you know, there's, there's interconnections between, you know, you're talking about moving hydrogen through pipelines in between countries and, and continents. Um, there are interlinkages uh, for as we move oil and gas and LNG around the world um, that, that link our economies together. Uh, you know, our fuel infrastructure together. Uh, Miriam, I want to come back to you. You know, in, in, it's easy to kind of dive down into the technology and the, the benefits and the challenges, but um, as if, if we were to imagine shifting, you know, this, this global fuel supply over to hydrogen, how is that going to affect uh, geopolitics from your view? Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. And, and that's actually a very, uh, very important question. One, I think not people realize that how um, a new energy source could potentially change the geopolitical or geostrategic status quo, so to say, that we have had so far based on traditional fossil fuels. Now, because um, zero carbon solutions have been growing so fast over the past few years, they have given way to new sources of wealth creation or wealth destruction. Um, for countries, uh, particularly fossil fuel producers, they now see that having a stake in the value chains of what could be considered um, clean energy technologies or climate safe technologies, such as hydrogen, can boost their country's economic competitiveness. Um, it provides energy security, it provides energy independence, in many cases, it also allows them to continue being, ex being exporters of a fuel and it increases national resilience. This is true for a number of countries. Um, and one of the early actions that has taken place with regards to hydrogen in this space is establishing technological leadership. 
Now, this can be developed across the hydrogen value chain um, and something that uh, Pere here was commenting on as well, and especially among countries who are seeking to export hydrogen and its uh, derivatives. If you are a technological leader, you're, the country will have the ability to influence standards, operating frameworks. Uh, we see this in the case of oil and gas, the largest oil and gas producers, they have their own cartel. We have OPEC, who is sort of sort of um, control the direction of global oil policy, so to say, although with hydrogen, this will differ due to wide variations in technology ownership. Um, countries like uh, Canada, Australia, most of EU, um, in the region, UAE and Saudi Arabia, they have seen a lot of activity in the technological space, um, particularly in the last couple of years. Um, other hydrogen upcomers like in Latin America or in North Africa, Morocco, or closer to us, Oman, they have seen lesser, although they can still play um, important roles uh, across every segment of the value chain, production, transformation, transportation, and uses. Um, for MENA countries, they have an advantage across most of these, um, particularly production due to lucrative conditions. They have good geography for renewables, low LCOEs, and they have carbon capture capabilities, and also transformation, at least with respect to ammonia. Um, to, to give it a spin on the geopolitical angle, apart from research and development, I think partnerships have now become an important metric in the leadership race. Um, so if you think about the flurry of deals that the UAE signed in the last year with a lot of Asian companies and also Saudi Arabia, um, in, in their race to become the lowest cost producers of hydrogen and export leaders. Um, I, I, what I notice is that this is a step towards scaling their hydrogen business internationally. Um, these countries have to first rely on blue hydrogen capabilities to establish a market while simultaneously entering into partnerships with pioneers in R&D to build up green hydrogen capabilities or the green hydrogen economy. The difference here is that once you enter into partnerships with green hydrogen innovators or technology developers, you have a dual benefit. You can leverage their expertise and you also establish a future potential export market um, for these countries. Now, um, in any country with renewable uh, potential, you could effectively produce green hydrogen once the costs for electrolysis fall that low, um, it will become increasingly competitive because it is a conversion process and not an extraction, it will it somewhat limits the possibilities of capturing economic rents like those generated by oil and gas. Um, and the new bilateral deals that are coming out might change political dynamics between countries that have traditionally not traded energy, which in turn could mean new rules for energy security, national resilience, diplomacy, etc. A blue hydrogen is advantageous, um, so to say, to natural gas producers today, or low cost natural gas producers, I should say, uh, because it can follow the, traje the trajectory of traditional LNG, the old LNG days, where early movers had an advantage in setting uh, the geoeconomic landscape for, uh, for the fuel. Um, but in saying that, with blue hydrogen, we might see similar import dependencies that we see in the case of gas that could lead to market volatilities something that green hydrogen can override because as, uh, as costs reduce and investments improve, um, uh, the energy relations would be regionalized. Um, hydrogen transport costs are still relatively high compared to renewable costs, uh, meaning that if renewables are deployed in several countries, the electricity generated could be exported, which could support hydrogen centers in the rest of the wider region. Thanks, Miriam. And, you know, I, I think you, that last point, um, you know, discussing sort of the transport costs um, and, and the, the net sort of total, total generation cost of hydrogen um, and delivery to the end user it is a big driver, uh, you know, certainly in, in the geopolitical scene. Um, so before we leave this question, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, Aman and Pere, given your, your respective experience in large energy companies, um, could, you, could you elaborate uh, from your perspective the kind of geopolitical um, impacts that hydrogen could have? Yeah, uh, actually, Mariam uh, covered very good ground on many, many important aspects, which also had on my mind to, to mention, but not repeating what uh, <laughs> excellently Mariam mentioned, I would add just a few other aspects. Now, first of all, um, I should have said in the first question addressed to me that uh, hydrogen is actually not only a, an energy source, 
but it is also a vector, a vector connecting and going across the sectors. So this is something quite new in the energy world. You know, you had primary sources of energy which had their own sphere of, um, let's say, influence and applications, etc. They would interact with each other, but now hydrogen, clean hydrogen, is actually a vector connecting many sectors which we have already covered. So this is one one attribute of, of additional attribute of clean clean hydrogen. The second one is that it is transformative. As I mentioned with the example of refinery and petrochemicals, it is actually creating or forcing us to create and become more innovative in terms of uh, inventing new processes and, and, and new products and new demands. But the mirror image of being a vector and being transformative is that this uh, clean hydrogen economy is also very much disruptive disruptive in many senses, uh, you know, in, in terms of technological aspects, which the colleagues have already uh, covered very good ground about, I would say it's also disruptive in terms of geopolitical considerations. So uh, as um, Mariam already mentioned, uh, you know, the whole, the whole um, importing, exporting energy uh, and trade map is being changed now, if and when clean hydrogen is going to 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 uh, to take to get traction well i mean it, it's not going to happen overnight we're going in steps and and, and many many processes and technologies uh, need to be matured but from whatever i'm seeing now uh, there are really disruptions in terms of for example certain countries which used to be the major resource holder mrh of of oil and gas some of them, they are still going to be the major resource holders for, for, for clean hydrogen, like, like, like Middle East and North Africa. Some of the new players are coming into the game, which have not been major resource holders, like in Latin America, like Chile, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, like Australia in terms of oil and gas, uh, in, uh, which, which they haven't played a bigger, quite a big role compared to Middle East. Uh, but then, you know, uh, this... This could create concern uh, in the major demand holders countries, which they would say, we are still going to be dependent on Middle East, for example, with all of the geopolitical ramifications and, and specificity of, of that region. But on the other side, uh, clean hydrogen is also creating uh, independency in terms of uh, energy demand, because there are many places in the world which used to be dependent on importing of of energy, the best example is China. Uh, they are going to be self-sufficient. I've not heard so far that China is planning big time for, for importing of, of clean hydrogen. They are uh, investing a lot for their own self-sufficiencies. And, and, and there, are, there are other countries which they have not been playing any role and uh, they are becoming self-sufficient self, self -sufficient as well. Like, like, like for example, India. And there are new countries which are coming and joining the, joining the club uh, for, for being a producer and exporter of, 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 of clean hydrogen, which, which we mentioned. Another impact which I would like to mention is on some other, uh, let's say, resources or materials. Take the example of, uh, you know, sensitive materials which are, which are needed for, for electrolyzers, those rare elements and, 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 and sensitive materials which are being dominated by certain countries like, like China or, or certain African countries. So this would certainly have a, geo, a geopolitical ramification as well. But to me, it is manageable because if the common goal is really to deliver on COP26 targets, uh, countries, corporations and institutions need to cooperate and, and address those, those challenges. Water is another example, you know, uh, for, for electrolysis, you need uh, plenty of water. And um, in the water stressed nations and, and regions, of course, you have the difficulty of hydrogen, let's say clean a green hydrogen in this case, competing with other, let's say, um, areas where water is badly needed, agriculture, industry, domestic, etc. But there are some projection, projections which are giving us some comfort, which is saying at the maturity, let's say by 2050, and hydrogen is going to uh, 
uh, demand relatively smaller, smaller, still very big amount of water compared to desalination for, for, uh, for, for let's say, uh, domestic or for municipality or for agriculture or for industry. So these are just, um, uh, on the other side, you know, the impact of uh, clean hydrogen on uh, development of the national economies and its impact on, uh, let's say, achieving the sustainable development goals and sustainability, not only from emission control, but also in terms of job creation, economic development, et cetera, et cetera, is significant. Uh, you may say it, it, it's good, but it might create also a sort of regional competition and let's say um, exodus of certain industries from one area to another, like we have seen already in the last few decades. Now, in this time, let's say um, catalyzed by, by the development of clean hydrogen and where clean hydrogen is, is cheaper and more abundant, those certain industries would migrate there and that could create a tension which needs of course, uh, regional and global cooperation to address. Um, I mean, uh, let's say another commercial aspect is just comparable to LNG. A few decades ago, as LNG was coming into the scene, people were amazed and they were actually, some of, some of my colleagues those days, let's say 30 years ago, 40 years ago, were quite pessimistic that uh, these kind of commercial uh, deals which were supposed to govern LNG, like take and pay kind of, uh, kind of deals for long term, 20 years, 25 years of offtake via, via uh, LNG and liquefaction of natural gas could ever uh, be realistic and not problematic. We have seen that there were some challenges, including geopolitical challenges and dependencies and push and pull, but this could, um, this could be addressed. And the, the, a similar, let's say, commercial uh, challenge could also be applicable to, to hydrogen in terms of in terms of geopolitics. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Aman. No, excellent points. Um, and, and you know, I think I think we could have a, a whole separate session on geopolitics. Um, Perry, I, I know there's been a lot covered. Any any final points on the geopolitic ge geopolitical oh. impact? Yeah, just a couple of points. One, um, just to give you some 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 data, uh, we've done, of course, very very deep analysis on transportation costs from certain areas in the world to Italy, for instance. Because not anywhere, not not everywhere, pipeline is a solution. We cannot be pipelines from Australia to Italy, for instance, or from Chile to Italy. That's that's not possible. So we're clear. We're, we're looking in detail at different hydrogen carriers. We're looking at. Of course, ammonia, we're looking at liquid organic carriers, we're looking at liquefied hydrogen. And what we found out is that by 2050, um, what 2030 really, um, the, the costs, the incremental cost per kilogram of hydrogen to bring this hydrogen from areas where the production is very, very cheap because there is a lot of solar, there is a lot of wind, it's not that critical. Um, is about it's between 30 and 50 cents per kilogram that you add um, per a thousand kilometers um, that you add on top of the production cost. And that's to bring hydrogen from these areas to um, other areas that there will be the use of this hydrogen. So relatively speaking, you, we can think of bringing hydrogen from far away where production is cheaper because the cost of transportation will not be uh, that uh, detrimental. Um, in the three forms, and actually the ammonia, liquid hydrogen, and liquid organic carriers are actually very, very close by, very similar in terms of cost by 2030. As of today, ammonia is the cheapest one. Uh, liquid hydrogen is the most expensive one because there are no vessels, commercial mm -hmm. vessels, to bring that hydrogen. But we think that by 2030, there will be commercial big vessels to bring liquid hydrogen. And liquid organic carriers, of course, that's very similar to today's fuel. So you can use the same type of vessels to bring this hydrogen from far away under these liquid organic carriers. That's one point. The other point is what Miriam said in terms of partnerships for innovation. I totally agree. And we're seeing actually a lot of initiatives going in this direction. We see a lot of what we call clean funds in which big corporations are joining forces to invest 
uh, on what we call venture infrastructure. We can see a lot of projects all over the world in which they're talking about big power plants that will make you know, blue power, which is using blue hydrogen to make electricity, for instance, hundreds of millions of investments. And we see a lot of companies, utilities, TSOs, oil and gas, joining forces to prove that concept first and then bring it to their countries. So that also in a way achieves uh, the geopolitics in terms of alliances to bring companies together that maybe before were not working together in that sense in terms of investing. Just last example, where now is now working on innovate the innovation sector in the US. We wanna build what we've built in Italy, but in the US in terms of networks of R&D and innovation and research centers. Well, we can do this alone, but we're already hearing from similar companies that are not direct competitors, but from the region, from South Europe, why don't we do this together? Okay, that's something that I think it's very interesting that uh, I haven't seen before. And I'll stop here. Absolutely, no, that, that's, um, love that, that approach, Pere, and look forward to seeing how that, that plays out, absolutely. Um, I wanna save a little bit of uh, room at the end for, for a few questions that are in the chat, but uh, for our final question, um, you know, when you think about, you know, we've talked about moving hydrogen through pipelines, um, you know, converting it to different forms to transport oversea. Um, and there's of course, you know, challenges, some technical challenges that, that need to be dealt with there. Um, but uh, uh, Manal, I'd like to come back to you uh, for your thoughts on, you know, kind of the, the safety and, and possible dangers of, of dealing with hydrogen as we transition to, to that as, as a uh, kind of a source fuel for, for all these applications? Yeah, that's a very important question. Um, so uh, we've mentioned hydrogen is the most abundant, um, I guess, elements in the world. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a gas, but it's in and of itself, it's not toxic like some of the other unconventional fuels. Uh, but is also highly flammable. So that is probably, because it's very light as well. So that requires, that means that you require to obviously condense it in large uh, quantities to liquefy it, but then also have significant, I guess, um, uh, testing in the hydrogen system to make sure that you can minimize the, 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 the challenge of flammability, whether it's, uh, you know, tech leak tests or different, um, I guess, uh, like the garage leak simulations and things like that, just to make sure that it's safe across the process in, um, especially when, when you're transporting it. And if we look at, I think, in terms of, um, you know, the fuel cell and, and uh, uh, in the transportation, particularly like hydrogen powered vehicles, um, obviously flammability then of the fuel itself is, is a problem, but then also, you know, electric shocks, for example. So we're not looking, obviously everything, all energy sources have some sort of a, a danger in using them, uh, but uh, these are the, the main important ones when it comes to hydrogen and it's essentially less than some of the other conventional fuels. Um, and then there's, um, I guess, um, uh, and because of that, what could also then think that maybe even green hydrogen then could also be safer than um, other forms as well. Um, and potentially one other danger that's not environmental, but maybe more of an economic uh, warning, I guess, kind of slightly shifting gears on the environment from the use of hydrogen um, is whether some of these investments are sustainable or whether they will be stranded at some point. I mean, Irina had been talking about this not of late that um, not long ago that potentially some of the investments in blue hydrogen, for example, with increased um, climate pledges and then with increase um, and maybe even carbon taxes and things that and, and the reduction of uh, um, investment uh, and electrolyzers cost, as we've heard, especially on, on green hydrogen front, that that could then maybe bring the cost of uh, green hydrogen down and then it would be more competitive and whether that would leave some investments of blue hydrogen perhaps stranded and, and not used. So that could also be a danger, particularly for um, uh, countries or companies that don't have already uh, investments in, in um, uh, or, or uh, not necessarily investments, maybe existing infrastructure in um, oil and gas that they can kind of naturally divert that to blue hydrogen because that's also one of the dangers uh, potentially of uh, going in a particular investment and where that would be sustainable in the future. And beyond that, I think that's probably enough to kind of cover both fronts um, for this question. No, thank you, Manal, and I love that point. Yeah, certainly with, with change and transition, um, you know, inevitably there are some stranded assets and technologies, uh, so we're certainly going to see that, um, you know, as, as we move forward. Um, Aman, any, any final points on, on the safety uh, aspects? 
Well, I just uh, try to be very concise, hopefully, so that we will have also room for questions. Actually, uh, in addition to what um, Manal very nicely covered, I would say, if I'm talking about, uh, you say danger, I would talk about risk. So I always have on my mind four categories of risk, technical, economical, commercial, and operational. So I put aside, uh, you know, political and, 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 and commercial, just focusing on operational and technical risk, which uh, might be also some concerns of people who are looking at hydrogen. First of all, in terms of production of hydrogen, everything is under control. I, hydrogen production is a slump dunk, uh, let's say industry, more than 100 years old, and it's being done safely in refineries, petrochemical complexes, and of course, the hydrogen products like methanol and ammonia, and, and you just named them. So in terms of uh, producing hydrogen and, and looking after safety aspects, uh, process safety, process and personal safety aspects, things are pretty much under control. Of course, the new thing is the electrolyzers at scale, which need, of course, to uh, have special focus and attention. But I would assume from whatever my chemical engineering experience and knowledge said that this will become under control in the coming years as well. Now, in terms of transportation, of course, liquefaction of, uh, of, of hydrogen is something which people are looking at as, as a challenging way of transporting it. I fully agree. The best uh, way of transportation probably for long haul is ammonia, liquid, uh, organic carrier, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, within shorter distances pipeline, but even uh, liquefaction and moving liquid hydrogen. Just a few days ago, there was an announcement that in Australia, this joint venture, HESC, Hydrogen Energy Supply Chain, which is a joint venture between Shell, some Japanese and some Korean, etc., and Australian players, they have uh, let their ship sail for the first time as a pilot uh, from Australia, Victoria to Japan. And this is, we're talking about a project which is supposed to produce 225 kiloton of hydrogen at scale as and when the last stair is, is reached. And they're going to do it back and forth and back and forth between Victoria and Kobe as a pilot and addressing many technical, uh, let's say questions, process safety issues to mature the whole thing. And this is a big project. This is, we're talking about again, 230 kiloton of hydrogen. And uh, it's, 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 it's being produced the hydrogen from gasification of combination of bio and coal, et cetera, et cetera with uh, CO2 being captured, et cetera. So even uh, liquid hydrogen transportation is now being done at scale uh, in this example, which I just mentioned. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aman. And, and you know, I think that's a, that's a great um, example that you raised that, you know, this is not all in the, in the political, um, theoretical realm, you know, that these, these pilots, um, you know, in, in these first steps are proving you know, out each each course of action and, and um, you know, the transport of, of liquid hydrogen at, at a large scale, um, you know, is being demonstrated and, and that's an important uh, big step forward. So we have uh, with the last remaining few minutes, uh, we're going to we're going to go to the uh, questions in the chat. Um, just scrolling through some some great uh, ideas and suggestions along the way. One question. Um, uh, is transport of hydrogen possible via pipelines? Um, I'll go ahead and answer the, uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, you know, companies are making investments um, to expand uh, that capability. Of course, there are, uh, you know, some technical challenges associated with doing so, uh, mainly due to the kind of the embrittlement um, from hydrogen of the steel seals, sensors, et cetera. So that, so that's, you know, some of the technology work that you hear uh, going on to prepare a, an existing pipeline to switch over or take increasing uh, concentrations of hydrogen. Uh, Eric, if you want, if you, if I may. Yeah, sure. SNAM, SNAM has 41,000 kilometers of pipeline transportation level 70 bars. We just finalized a study that took two years and we determined that 90% of our pipes are 100% 100% hydrogen ready already. Now, the problem is not the pipeline, the problem it will be the compression stations that will have to be retrofit. 
and the end users, not all the end users will be able to take that hydrogen. So we also have to protect that, those end users. And that's why we're working on membrane uh, technologies to separate the methane from the hydrogen because it will not be a shift 100% methane to 100% hydrogen. It will be a blend where we will be slowly putting more hydrogen until at some point it's gonna be all hydrogen. But we need to protect the end users in two ways. By membranes, so we separate the hydrogen and we use the hydrogen for something else, or by helping these end users to be able to use the blend, and that's what I was referring before. Thanks, Perry. Yeah, I did uh, incidentally read that you know that the grade of uh, steel that's in that that's used in the European pipelines uh, is is already compatible, which is which is great news for hydrogen. Um, thanks for that point. Um, another question that was asked. Um, how, how do you think about uh, uh, generating green hydrogen in countries with a lot of renewable, but poor in, in terms of water resource? Um, Muthana, uh, do you want to you want to take that one? Hi. It's um, well, depends on where. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yes, it's a challenge. Um, um, we, we're quite fortunate here in the UAE also that we are we sit on a very uh, on the belt of the. The most efficient solar belt on the on earth and uh, yeah. that goes around from you know the middle east and north africa and uh, probably south, south america somewhere in between and also far east where there's a lot of sunlight and you can produce it the, the water is going to be a challenge definitely yes indeed and uh, a lot of attempts now has been you know looked at whether if we can electrolyze the sea water and that we can transport it in a different you know as as my previous uh, colleagues have mentioned earlier there are ways of we can transport so it could be generated somewhere where there is a water source and there is a solar power and they can be generated like for example from africa to europe or from yeah. middle east to far east and so that's the probably is going to be the solution for the future. Yeah, excellent points. Thanks, thanks, Bethana. Uh, so we've come to the end of our time, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I hopefully, uh, as everyone has, I've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion, uh, learned a lot today, and I want to thank our panelists uh, for your time and contributions today, and also for everybody who's tuned in uh, for your time, and and hope you uh, also enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, and talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.